Elon Musk says he'll pay more than $11 billion in taxes this year. Politicians like Elizabeth Warren are pushing for more rigid tax codes. Now, iTrust Capital offers crypto IRAs as well as precious metals IRAs that will help protect your wealth against taxes. If you use my link, itrust.capital/darren, you'll receive a hundred dollars funding reward. So be sure to research IRAs and iTrust Capital. What's the world's greatest lie? It's this: that at a certain point in our lives, we lose control of what's happening to us and our lives become controlled by fate. Please remember, none of this is financial advice. The SDRs by the IMF are supposed to be a liquidity format to help supplement the current system, but they're basically worthless. Um, We could get into why that is, but essentially the IMF SDR has the same problem that everybody, any other potential uh, competing answer uh, does, which is what we said before, There's no infrastructure for it. It's simply an accounting fiction that's maintained at the national level, and it has very limited, in fact, no real practical use. So if you want to use SDRs as sort of a competing currency, you're, again, you're starting from scratch. You need to build a new internet. You need to build a new internet that trades in SDRs. And that's really the task before it. And because of that, it's not really a not really a realistic alternative, and it really wasn't meant to be. It was sort of meant to be a supplement to the to the Bretton Woods system, and then of course that got changed really pretty much as soon as SDRs were were inter- introduced. And the other part of it, central bank digital currencies are not really native digital currencies. They're sort of central banks digitizing the way they do things now. For example, think about you know the Federal Reserve or the ECB having digital electronic accounts with not just banks but also individual individuals. It doesn't really change the the uh, the makeup of the currency system or the arrangement of how the currency system actually works on a fundamental level. It just changes the appearance of how people are transacting with the system as it already is. Now you can see why central banks would want to develop something like that because then that that that, that uh, it sort of uh, maintains the status quo where everybody thinks the central banks are central banks. But it's not really a replacement, nor is it intended to be a replacement to the actual monetary system on a very detailed or a very uh, fundamental. This is an older article with Christine Lagarde quotes. Correspondent banking is the blood that delivers nutrients to different parts of the body. At its core, to the business of 3,700 banks in 200 countries, a global bank like Society Generale, for example, manages 1,700 correspondent accounts and processes 3.3 million correspondent transactions every day. Society Generale is also a Ripple partner. The perceived problem, as we've covered before, relates to heightened banking standards in the wake of the global financial crisis. Everything from know your customer, anti-money laundering, and combat financing of terrorism rules. Many of these strange alternatives, meanwhile, hail from technology from the technological sector. And while Lagarde didn't explicitly mention cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin, it's certainly the case that such systems would qualify as strange alternatives. She added that these technologies are coming whether we like them or not. So it makes no sense to deploy them transparently as a force for good as opposed to, we presume, the offsetting force for bad if deployed by the wrong hands opaquely. The IMF would need to enhance structure from technology point of view and from a market capacity point of view. So Christine Lagarde is talking about the problem with correspondent banking and uh, these KYC AML requirements. The big incumbents are losing out on money and they're not doing this because they're they're uh, charitable. They're doing this because they make money with it. So a lot of these a lot of these nations are are having issues with liquidity, issues with AML. So the correspondent uh, talks to the respondent bank and um, the correspondent doesn't really know anything about the respondent's customers. The respondent's responsible for the customer's information. And if the correspondent uh, sends money to the respondent that they shouldn't have, they get fined millions of dollars and, and they have the reputational risks too. So a lot of these big banks will show up on the news as uh, doing stuff with money laundering and everything and huge fines are being paid. So there's a real problem with correspondent banking and uh, a lot of people think that the incumbents uh, 
don't want to see this this happen, but that's not true. They're they want to make money. This is all this is about is making money. If they're losing money, these smaller nations don't have an economy. They can't export, they can't import if they can't talk to the correspondent banks. Over the last uh, decade, uh, global banks have been uh, tightening operations to uh, comply with uh, regulations designed to uh, curtail money laundering and um, terrorism financing. As a consequence, uh, global banks have been uh, limiting uh, correspondent banking uh, relationships with uh, local banks in emerging and uh, developing economies. Arguably, the most um, impacted region is uh, AME, Africa and Middle East. Uh, global correspondent uh, banking relationships have uh, fallen by uh, around 25% since uh, 2009. This is a Bank of International Settlements article. It talks about correspondent banking, and it's got some charts of correspondent banking declining. So if you're a global international bank and you set up all these all these different correspondent relationships all over the globe and you're getting fined for your respondents KYC due diligence and it's not working out, you're getting fined. You're also in jurisdictions where the currency is inflating, right? You have a set amount of currency with the respondents, they have a set amount of it with you, and the currency that you have in their bank is declining in purchasing power, it's losing out compared to the dollars that you would have had. What's the point of, of setting up these correspondent banking relationships, right? And you can see that the worst ones are the, the ones that Ripple's partnered with. So I don't think correspondent banking is going away with, you know, Europe to the United States. But with with Palau, right, with uh, some of these, the Philippines, some of these smaller nations that we've seen a lot of traction with Ripple, they're losing out on the correspondent banking. And there's no incentive for the correspondent, for the big banks to reset up those those lines, right? And the whole point of the IMF is to make sure that these countries are included in the global economy, right? And it's it's beneficial for the global economy to have these developing nations, emerging markets, a part of the global economy, as well as the IMF also sets up the uh, guidance for tech, right? So they, they help with the infrastructure, they guide these nations on the technology aspect of this. Uh, I was in talking to one of the largest global money center banks on the planet, and I was talking to them about our primary product, Fiat Fiat, called X Current. And it, this guy kind of interrupts me. He's like, yeah, 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 that's nice, but I have a problem settling into Peru. Can I use XRP to help me settle into Peru? And honestly, I was like, holy shit. Like, you know, here's one of the biggest <laughs> banks in the world who has more liquidity than almost anybody out there, and I'm not even trying to talk to him about crypto and digital assets. I'm trying to talk to him about the, the, the core of Fiat to Fiat. And, it, you know, he's already looking ahead and realizing that, look, th this is something that could help me solve a problem in Peru. And I don't want to necessarily hold currency in Peru from an inflation point of view or a regulatory risk point of view, a compliance risk. So they're looking for other solutions. And again, if, if you solve a real problem for real customers, it's going to work out. One of the largest money center banks on the planet. I'm going to take an educated guess that Brad was talking about Bank of America, a RippleNet partner. Bank of America would be a correspondent bank in Peru. They don't want to have the relationship due to compliance, regulatory, and currency risks. Now, if you're a Bank of America and you have customers that need to get money to Peru, you want to offer that service that caters to your customers, but the correspondent relationship is costing you money. If you can utilize Ripple's ODL model in order to satisfy your customers' needs and to back out of that costly relationship, that is a win-win. The trend for correspondent banks are declining, and Ripple is able to get money into these nations in a regulated manner for cheaper. The IMF does not want to see developing countries get squeezed out of the global economy. That is why I think we have seen so much with the IMF and Ripple. It's a technology that they approve of, and what they are not saying is telling. They spoke against El Salvador. They spoke against the Marshall Islands. They haven't spoke out against Palau. But it is really important who has the rails on which everything else runs. So that's 5G and 6G. And then I would say behind that are a couple of others, certain aspects of biotechnology, but not all of it. CRISPR, gene editing, some of those things, the genie is already out of the bag, so you can't restrict it. But there are certain areas that are dual use where we should be careful and we should re remain in the lead. Quantum 
It's a little farther out, but we should be worrying about it. And increasingly, and this is an area where India is really has leapfrogged the U.S. and the West, and that's financial technologies. And this gets a little wonky, but bear with me. For a long time now, for decades, the U.S. and Europe dominated the international financial payment systems uh, through correspondent banking, through the SWIFT system. It's slow. It's outdated technology. It needs to be replaced. But it's also how we impose sanctions on bad actors. And increasingly here, China is really very, very good. They're really in the lead, you know, between Alipay and WeChat Pay and all of the other apps, you know, India uses them a lot more than we do, but it's really sophisticated and great. And now combine that with the digital yuan, and you could have a situation very soon where, you know, Chinese companies control those rails. So that's not to say they they shouldn't, but we should make sure that we stay competitive. We, by we, I mean India, the US, our friends um, in that space as well. So those are, to me, the technologies that are most important. The technologies that are most important are financial technologies. We need to stay competitive to compete with China. Their payment infrastructure like WeChat and Alipay is ahead of the U.S. And combined with the digital one, we are seeing an efficient financial system that competes with SWIFT and correspondent banking. China has the Belt and Road Initiative where they are giving loans to developing nations in order to develop. When you get a loan from China, you are going to pay China back with their system that right now is trying to separate from the traditional correspondent banking system. Approach bringing your technology to the Asian market, for example. Well, so a couple thoughts to that. We now have uh, seven offices around the world. Uh, we have an office, a joint venture in Tokyo. Uh, we have an office in Singapore, we have an office in Mumbai. Uh, so we, we're, by nature of the work we do as a cross-border transactions, we work with banks around the world. We go to the local organizations and work with them locally. So we have offices around the world. We don't yet have an office in China. Uh, we certainly have looked at that. I, I think the likelihood is, and you know, I think many of us are aware that many Silicon Valley companies have looked at how do we enter the market in China, and we have generally concluded doing that with a partner or with partners. And I think certainly as we think about that opportunity, I think we'll do the same. Uh, you know, I think it, for a whole bunch of reasons, there, that's a, a better path forward. Uh, but there's no doubt that in China and every other country, solving that cross-border friction is, is critical. Now, I'll also proactively say, one of the things that has differentiated Ripple from you know, many in the ecosystem is we have taken the pro- approach of we're going to work with governments. We're going to work with banks. We're not going to try to circumvent governments. We're not going to try to circumvent banks. And I think that has differentiated us. It has made us a bit contrarian in the early days. I think increasingly people have realized maybe that's a better strategy. Uh, I don't think governments are going to go away. But even as I think about uh, you know, markets, including China, we certainly would want to work with the PBOC uh, and uh, define how we enter. Because we only work with Ripple only works with regulated exchanges. We, you know, the Bank of England is a paid customer. The Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority is a paid customer of Ripple's. And you know, these are examples of how we're working with global regulators around the world. MoneyGram has a strong presence in China. Ant Financial is going to purchase MoneyGram and was blocked by Ch- President Trump. The first companies to be granted a banking license in China were Amex and Linlin Pay, both RippleNet partners. After, money, after the MoneyGram and Ripple partnership was dissolved, Ripple immediately bought shares in Tranglo and partnered with them. Tranglo has a presence in China and it is partnered with WeChat and Alipay. So China is building a separate financial system and Ripple's model is to partner with the companies that are already partnered with China. So Ripple certainly wants to work with the PBOC. So Jay Clayton writes an article for the Wall Street Journal, the same Jay Clayton that ended up suing Ripple, and he used to work for the SEC. So Jay Clayton writes an article, America's Future Depends on Blockchain, which I'm not going to read the whole article, but uh, basically what he talks about is that the U.S. needs to get on board with this, this technology is real, and it's a matter of national security. They need to move forward. So it's always interesting to me that Jay Clayton does this when he's leaving, and it falls right into Gary Gensler's lap. Gary Gensler has run simulations on this exact type of scenario with China taking over as, as world reserve currency with their digital yuan. 
And in those in those simulation, Gary Gensler knows the problems just like Jay Clayton knows the problems. Now, for Bank of America to get money into Peru, what needs to happen? Bank of America can't just use XRP, right? There needs to be regulatory clarity and that's what's that's what I think this lawsuit's about is to to give XRP the non-security clarity that it needs. Right? So, um I was watching Do John Deaton last night and he talks about the case being weak and that we're on the right so side of this. We're on the right side of this. So, it's every. It's very interesting how this is all playing out. It's very interesting how MoneyGram had ties into China. Uh, the partnership gets dissolved, and then immediately Ripple partners with Tranglo and Novati. They both have the inroads into China, and China's moving forward with their digital one. Uh, Swift, Russia, China. They're bypassing Swift. There's a lot going on, and I I believe that. Ripple is the American tech company that builds this bridge into China. Or countries that are ahead in the tech race tend to be the most powerful on earth, right? Chinese gunpowder, British steamships, Roman roads, right? And the countries that lead in technology really tend to lead the world and also become the most powerful militaries. Everyone seems to have a clear idea of how other people should lead their lives but none about his or her own. Thanks everyone, I hope you enjoyed the show. Please take a moment to like and subscribe. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you're interested in supporting this channel, please consider joining my Patreon.